If ever there was a year for an actress to complain about pay discrepancy, the year was 2017. If ever there was a year for an actress to complain about pay discrepancy, the year was 2017. And not because Emma Stone made $26 million for her Oscar winning performance in La La Land and her male co-star Ryan Gosling. He only made $8 million for the film that did $472 million at the box office against a $30 million budget. No, it's because that one performance accounted for her entire earnings on the year. And she only received that amount of money because she had a bunch of performance-based incentives in her contract and she owned a portion of the back end of the movie. It was a once-in-a-lifetime contract for an actor, yet still... She finished behind 14 of her male counterparts in earnings for the year. And actors like Mark Wahlberg and Vin Diesel, The Rock and Adam Sandler, they made more than double what Emma Stone did in 2017 for her Oscar-winning performance. Starring in her first commercial before the age of one, 30 years later at the age of 31, Drew Barrymore was the highest paid actress in the entire world, with her career really taking off in the mid-1990s and early 2000s after starring in films like Batman Forever, Scream, Charlie's Angels, and The Wedding Singer. This paved the way for her and her co-star Adam Sandler to command half of a $75 million budget on a film called 51st Dates on their salaries alone. She was also paid $15 million to star alongside Jimmy Fallon in Fever Pitch. The $22 million she made in 2005, that's roughly $35 million today adjusted for inflation. And at 31 years old, she is the second youngest actress ever to be the highest paid actress in the entire world, with Jennifer Lawrence holding the record in 2015 when she was just 26 years old. In a sign of how truly far pay discrepancy has actually came, in 1987, Jane Fonda was the highest paid actress in the world, making $13 million on the year, which is roughly $36 million today. For comparison, in 1987, the highest paid actor in the world was Sylvester Stallone, who made more than six times what Fonda did at $74 million. And the funniest part about her wealth in 1987 was it had nothing to do with making movies. In fact, she didn't star in a single film from 1986 to 1989. Instead, focusing on her charity work and her at-home exercise tapes, with the first one coming out in 1982. And it became the first non-theatrical home video to top the sales charts. In fact, it was the number one selling home video for six straight years. And still to this day, it is the number one selling home video of all time, moving over 17 million copies. Jodie Foster would have never been on this list had it not been for Nicole Kidman because she was originally cast in Panic Room. In fact, they filmed two weeks of the movie with Kidman in the lead, but then she got injured on set, a lingering injury from her just wrapping production on Moulin Rouge that forced her to drop out of the film. So. Production was now in a bind, and they called up Jodie Foster, and they offered her $15 million to step in and take over the lead of the film, which was a career best for her at the time. And after the movie came out, and it became a modest success, with Foster's performance being universally praised, she once again became in demand as an actress, which allowed her to command $20 million to star in the film Flight Plan, which was one third of the production budget, which turned out to be worth it after it did $225 million worldwide at the box office. And that same year, she starred in Spike Lee's movie Inside Man, being paid $7 million to star alongside Denzel Washington. And the $27 million she made in 2006, adjusted for inflation, is just over $42 million today. The most she was ever paid for one film was in 2005, when she got $17.5 million to star in Bewitched. However, after she divorced Tom Cruise in 2001, they split his $350 million fortune equally. And ironically, 
after that divorce is when Kidman started rolling in the dough herself from 2003 to 2007. It was the peak of her career and she was making on average $15 million per movie. So it's no wonder with making three movies in the year 2007, it was the most lucrative year of her entire career. And since then, she also was paid $1 million per episode to star in the HBO hit Big Little Lies and received $12 million for starring in commercials for Chanel Number no. 5. And oh, by the way, those commercials you see play before a movie at AMC theaters that she stars in, they cost $25 million to make, with reportedly her earning a big chunk of that figure. One of the few actresses in Hollywood who has had huge box office success in female-led films, Angelina Jolie was paid $10 million for Mr. and Mrs. Smith, $15 million for Wanted, and $20 million for Salt. This was after Tom Cruise was reportedly attached to star in the film, but he wanted too much money, so the producers replaced him with Angelina Jolie. However, she would rewrite the record books when Disney paid her $33 million to star in Maleficent. That is about $45 million today adjusted for inflation, and that is the largest upfront payment ever given to an actress in the history of Hollywood, making her the highest paid actress of 2013. However, Jolie would break that record seven years later when she was paid $35.5 million to star in The Eternals. However, Maleficent, unlike The Eternals, it was a big box office success. It quadrupled its budget and it spawned a sequel where Jolie was paid $28 million up front plus a portion of the box office profits, which figures to be quite significant because it did over $500 million worldwide at the box office. When the first Twilight movie came out in 2008, Kristen Stewart was a relative unknown and she received $2 million for the first film. However, for the next two sequels, she got a significant pay bump, getting $10 million for each film. And by the fourth installment, a two-part film, Breaking Dawn 1 and 2, she was receiving $25 million up front, plus 7.5% of the back-end profit participation. And considering the two films combined did $1.5 billion dollars worldwide at the box office against a 300 million dollar budget it is safe to assume that figure was quite significant and in 2012 she also starred in snow white and the huntsman for which she was paid 9.5 million dollars a film that would turn out to be another hit and launch another franchise. In total, for 2012, Kristen Stewart made $34.5 million, which today, adjusted for inflation, is over $47 million. When Modern Family first began in 2008, Sofia Vergara was making $30,000 per episode. By 2020, in the show's final season, she was making $500,000 per episode, which was about $10 million a season. And in addition to that, her and her castmates, they also negotiated a portion of the back-end profit participation in their final contract, which amounts to roughly $13 million a year in residuals once the show hit syndication. Plus, she was a judge on America's Got Talent, earning $10 million a year from that gig. And on top of that, she was a brand spokesperson, earning $14.25 million for working with companies like CoverGirl, Comcast, AT&T, Diet Pepsi. And she has a clothing line that has an exclusive contract with Walmart. So in 2020, she earned roughly $43 million, which today, adjusted for inflation, is about $52 million. Friends went off the air in 2004, with each of the main six cast members making $1 million per episode for the final two seasons of the show, which is $42 million for 42 episodes of television, or $252 million for all six of them combined. However, NBC... They can afford it because 20 years after the show went off the air, they are still receiving 
$1 billion a year in revenue from the residuals of the show. And each of the main cast members, they get 2% of that, which is roughly $20 million per year for each of them in royalties. And to go along with that, in 2003, Jennifer Aniston was paid $21 million to star alongside Jim Carrey in Bruce Almighty, making her the highest paid actor of the year, $36 million, which today, adjusted for inflation, is almost $60 million. Most actors, <laughs> let me rephrase that, people in general would be satisfied with $15 million for a few months of work on a film like Avengers Endgame. But when you're Black Widow herself, Scarlett Johansson, you also negotiate a portion of the box office profit. So when the movie does 2.8 billion dollars worldwide at the box office becoming one of the highest grossing films in the history of Hollywood, you net yourself an extra 35 million dollars, meaning you can do whatever the hell you want for the rest of the year. You don't have to focus on making money. You instead can go after more awards bait type fare, which is exactly what she did in 2019 when she also did Jojo Rabbit, which was nominated for five Academy Awards, including her for Best Supporting Actress. And that same year, she also did Marriage Story, which was nominated for six Academy Awards, including her for Best Actress. Actress, meaning 2019 is one of the greatest years financially and critically for any actor in the history of Hollywood. Being the star of not just one, but two big film franchises will certainly get you on this list. First, for portraying Mystique in X-Men Days of Future Past, paying her $6 million for that role. A long way away from her first movie in the X-Men franchise where she was paid just $250 thousand dollars and then for the hunger games the final two films in the force film series she was paid 20 million dollars each for the final two movies that were filmed back to back which is a far cry from the five hundred thousand dollars she made a few years earlier for the first film a great investment by the studio because those last two movies they did combined over 1.5 billion dollars worldwide at the box office and also in 2015, she also starred in the epic bomb with her friend Bradley Cooper, Serena, that paid her $6 million and only made $5 million at the box office. Her $52 million she made that year, adjusted for inflation, is just below $70 million, making her the youngest actress at the age of 26 to be the highest paid actress in the world in the history of Hollywood. This isn't even the year that Cameron Diaz signed the legendary Bad Teacher contract where she only took $1 million up front for a portion of the back-end proceeds, netting her $40 million. Now, 2008, she did two movies. The first being Shrek the Third, that did over $800 million worldwide at the box office. But once again, she sacrificed upfront salary for a portion of the back-end profits, netting her $30 million. And then... That same year, she starred alongside Ashton Kutcher in What Happens in Vegas. And once again, she stuck to her script, forfeiting upfront salary for a portion of the box office proceeds. So when the $35 million budgeted film did over $220 million worldwide at the box office, Cameron Diaz netted herself a cool $20 million, meaning she did two movies in 2008, made herself $50 million, which today... Adjusted for inflation is nearly $73 million. At just 33 years old, Margot Robbie is the third youngest actress ever to be named the highest paid actress in the entire world, trailing only Drew Barrymore in 2005, who was 31 years old, and Jennifer Lawrence in 2015, who was 26 years old. However, Neither of them made as much as Robbie did in a year. In 2023, she made $78 million, which today, adjusted for inflation, is over $80 million, due in large part to the global phenomenon that was Barbie, that did over $1.45 billion worldwide at the box office. And Robbie, 
as the producer and star of the film that developed the project with Mattel, she not only received $12.5 million up front, she also received 12.5% of all profits on the back end from merchandising and licensing, meaning Robbie made $78 million in 2023, but she is set up to make tens of millions of dollars every single year for the rest of her life. Life for an actress in Hollywood can be difficult, with good roles being few and far between, especially when you compare it to their male counterparts. That gets even worse when a woman gets over the age of 40. However, Sandra Bullock, she bucked that trend in 2010 when she forfeited her upfront salary to star alongside Ryan Reynolds in the romantic comedy The Proposal, a role that was originally offered to Julia Roberts, but she turned it down. That movie would go on to gross $320 million worldwide at the box office against a $30 million budget, netting Bullock $36 million herself. And that same year, she also starred in the sports drama The Blind Side, a film that she was paid $20 million up front for and would go on to net over $310 million worldwide at the box office and win her an Academy Award for Best Actress. That year, she made $56 million, which today, adjusted for inflation, is over $80 million. The queen of the romantic comedy had an unprecedented run of hits during the 1990s, which allowed her to become the highest paid actress in the world for three straight years from 1998 to 2000, with 1999, both Runaway Bride and Notting Hill being released. And in Notting Hill, she portrays a movie star, and 38 minutes into the film, her character is asked how much money she makes per movie, to which she responds, $15 million, which is actually how much Roberts was making in real life for Notting Hill and Runaway Bride. And in 1999, she also shot Aaron Brockovich that didn't come out until March 2000. For that film, she was paid $20 million of the film's $52 million production budget, which in the end proved to be worth it because it did over $250 million worldwide at the box office and it won her the Academy Award for Best Actress. On the year, she made $50 million, which today, adjusted for inflation, is almost $95 million. Before she got canceled for sending out racist tweets and the show being revived without her and called the Connors, for the final season of Roseanne, Roseanne Barr was paid $875,000 an episode or about $20 million a season all the way back in 1997. However, in 1993, she signed a contract that paid her $1 million per syndicated episode. And with 222 episodes from 1988 to 1997 as the star, writer, creator, and executive producer, she earned a reported extra $35 million per year, meaning in 1997, with the addition of the $20 million and then that $35 million, she made $55 million on the year, which today, adjusted for inflation, is over $107 million. Her media company, Hello Sunshine, is backed by the private equity firm Blackstone Group, which has over $1 trillion in assets under management, making it the largest investment firm in the entire world. And back in 2016, Witherspoon, she founded this production company with a simple model. She would start a book club and promote it to her legions of followers, gaining steam on these books that she would then own the rights to be developed into movie and television, monetizing those followers as leverage to go and get it made into a movie or television, which allowed her to cash in in a major way because she owned all the underlying rights and intellectual property. So when movies like Gone Girl and TV shows like Big Little Lies became big hits, Reese Witherspoon and her company, they're the ones who profited the most. And over time, Hello Sunshine, they built up an impressive library of titles to the point. In 2021, they sold the company for $900 million, with Witherspoon herself cashing in $115 million, which today, adjusted for inflation, is over $133 million.